Yeah, the book of Eli here on here on movies, the movie show, uh, movies and movies, the movie show we call it. Uh, we're with George Kaysen and me, and we do this every couple of weeks, and we review a movie. And this one is really odd. It's probably like no other movie we've ever reviewed, George. Yep. But I want to tell you in advance, George. This is George Kaysen, our movie reviewer uh, and a, a graduate student at the University of uh, Hawaii. Um, George, I disagree with you completely. I want you to know that now, going in, okay. in advance, about this movie. Okay. The Book of Eli with Denzel Washington. But why don't you tell your view of it, and then I will tell you why I disagree with you completely. Okay. I don't know what you're going to disagree with, but my view is this is post-apocalypse world after the nuclear war. Shows what the nuclear war will do to the world, right? And uh, you've got this guy, Denzel Washington, who's playing by Eli, by Denzel Washington. And he is on a trek across the United States. And you see all this desolation from one end to the other. Um, it's like the back to the Wild West. So as he's going across, right? Mad Max, Mad Max at Thunderdome. Yeah. That's what it is. You, you know movies better than I do. But the thing is, he, he gets all these roving gangs that are trying to attack him, you know? Um, you know, to get whatever's in his backpack, but they don't even know what is there, but they, they go and they hurt a lot of people, you know, just regular people to get, grab their food or grab whatever else. So he's got great powers, you know, he's able to kill like seven or eight guys that are attacking him, you know, and he's going across and um, he comes to this town, which is guy, um, Carlisle, uh, Champlain or whatever. The, no, the, no, it was a, it was a the steel magnate. Yeah, Carnegie. 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 Carnegie is the is the war is the warlord there. Yeah. And he he's a reader. He reads just like Eli is a reader. And all the young ones that since the thirty years since the nuclear war they don't read. So these two have have a, a skill that nobody else has, right? So this guy Carnegie, right? Scene. Played by Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman, who, who right. is one of my favorite actors ever. Yes, Gary Oldman. He knows that there's. A, he's looking for a book. He knows it's going to give him power if he has this book, and the, and all the copies were destroyed during the nuclear war. So he's looking for this book, and he finds out basically. Um, Mila Kunis is a Jennifer Beals daughter, you know, uh, Jennifer mm -hmm. Beals is his mistress, Carnegie's mistress, and she's blind, right? And then her daughter is Solara, played by Myla Kunis. Um, she... Solara. Solara, right. She, she uh, befriends this, um, you know, Carnegie wants her to go and uh, sleep with Denzel, you know, um, Eli, so that she, she can get information. So you know, basically to get Eli on his side. He wants Eli to be there to help him in this little hick town, you know, this wet wild west, <laughs> the wild west kind of, of, of town, you know, from the, from the 1800s. Okay, so she, she, he doesn't want to sleep with her, but she, he sits her there and he says the Lord's Prayer. You know, he says a prayer from the, from, from the Bible. And then, and then the, the later that day, um, so, so Lana, she goes in front of with her mother and she starts reciting this prayer. And then Carnegie realizes that this guy, Eli, there's a book, you know, that it's from that book that he's looking for, right? He's looking for the book because he knows it's going to give him power, right? So meantime, Eli is on this mission to go across the country to San Francisco. We don't know yet, but it's Alcatraz Island where those who are trying to resurrect the world, you know, the learning from before the nuclear war. So he's on a mission. And on the way, they stop, he and, and uh, Solara, they, Solana, they, they stop at this house where this old couple is there, Martha and George, right? And they offer them tea. So it seems okay. And then they bring out meat, but Eli isn't smart enough to smell that this is human meat. So he realizes they're <laughs> cannibals. Because there's no vegetable. I mean, they're not growing any vegetables. How are they eating? They kill people and pack the meat, right? So, so, so they escape. 
And they have and a cemetery in the backyard. Cemetery in the backyard. All the people backyard. they've killed. They killed for and, their And you catch the telltale sign when you shake hands with somebody who is a, a what do you call it, um, uh, who accountable. Uh, the 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 handshakes, their handshakes. So it, it's it's a subtle point in the movie. Whenever you shake hands with somebody, you have to watch out that their hand is not shaking. If their hand is shaking, they will be eating you. Exactly. So that so there's all these little subtle cues that I didn't catch all of them. But, but so so eventually, like just to with get he a lot of battles with all these gangs and stuff. Finally, they get to he and Solana Solara. They get to Alcatraz, right? And, and this is what really bothered me about this movie, right? Here's a guy, Eli, that's being able to kill eight people at a shot. And then at the end, the Bible, it's not in, in print. It's in Braille. Now, how the hell can a blind man <laughs> kill eight people? Even You don't even... remember Zatoichi? No, I don't. Zatoichi, when I arrived in Hawaii, was all the rage in all the theaters. Yeah. especially the J Japanese theaters, and he was the blind swordsman. He could cut a fly in half with his sword, and he was blind. Same thing. Well, so this guy was a, and he, he was protected, right? He's protected by the book. And the book happens to be the Bible, the last Bible, you know, and where you disagree with me, we can talk about that after. But I mean, I'm, I'm a biblical scholar. I used to go to um, in Westwood Village, uh, Logos, the Christian bookstore, and read all the ap ap apocryphal texts. And I know in college, we took Buddhism and Hinduism and all the religions of the world, Judaism. So I'm, I'm sort of broader picture. But I, I went to bookstores too when I was a kid uh, uh, in Greenwich Village mostly, and they, they, didn't, they didn't have Bible bookstores there. They had other kinds of bookstores there where I grew up, I tell you, George. Sorry, go ahead. This, yeah, this is Westwood Village in California when I moved there when I was 29, 30 years old. So bottom line is right next to the vegetarian restaurant um, at the time. So bo bottom line is there's, I have issues with the, with the it doesn't make sense. How can, how can you have, I mean, you said, but to me, a blind man can't kill eight people. I mean, this Japanese uh, samurai was he able to see eight people from being blind? Oh, yeah, easily, easily. Oh, yeah, he had that sixth sense. Okay, but so leave it at that. And you can tell me where you disagree with me, okay? Well, not with everything, George. Uh, but let me say, let me, let me give you my rendition of the movie, okay? Okay, um, sure. The first, the time frame. The movie was actually um, came out in 2010. That's 12 years ago. Exactly. Um, and it, it won all kinds of awards and had a lot of critical acclaim for the movie. Because it was so creative, so unusual, and so symbolic. So the things that you're concerned with are they're symbols. They're they're not the real story. Mm -hmm. This is this is really built around uh, the dystopian world that was 30 years after an atomic blast. And if you do the math, um, it was in, in 2043. Back 30 years would have been what? Um, 2013. 13. 13. Yeah. Um, and um, they called him the walker, uh, Denzel Washington. He was a walker. Yeah. He wasn't the only one. Uh, there was a nomenclature about what he did. And he didn't cross the country straight because here's the thing you might not have caught. Um, he, he went where he went in blindness. Yeah, he was blind. He was blind. Uh, and there were, there were, there were, there were tip-offs on that all through the movie, although it's not obvious. Um, and he went in a zigzag pattern. He was walking west across the country for 30 years. And he had achieved a, a tremendous talent in terms of self-defense, in terms of, uh, you know, obtaining the food and supplies that he needed. Um, and he would eat small animals, including cats, for example. I don't know if you caught that part. Yes, I caught um, it. Well, it was at the beginning, yeah. And, yeah, and, um, you know, he was he was very talented and he had this book that was given to him it was the saint james bible you only found out at the end that it was in braille um and that um you know was his mission to read it again and again and again and and, and commit it to memory which he did 
Uh, yeah, he didn't and, find it. He, he, he found it in, in, in rubble. It wasn't given to him. He, he that's was right. Fortunate. And, he, and oh. the argument was that that was the only one left in the world exactly. because the nuclear holocaust had destroyed everything, including yeah. all the other copies. So it was a lucky break that he had that. Um, and maybe it was, you know, divine, but lucky anyway. Uh, and he learned how to handle himself uh, alone, always alone, walking zigzag across the country to the, to the Pacific Ocean. Yep. To Alcatraz, he yep. he knew where he was going. Um, well, maybe he didn't, but he <clears throat> he walked in in wherever it took him, wherever the journey took him, and he was able to cope with some really ugly people, uh, yes. including the uh, the Gary uh, Oldman uh, yeah. character Carnegie. 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 Yeah. He knew that there was a Bible book, and he knew the power it gave. And this is where I start to disagree with you. Um, and he, he wanted it because he thought it would empower him yes. to complete his control over the, the community in that town. Yeah. He was the, you know, the badass guy who runs the town is what it was. But th don't, don't, don't treat it as an 18th century town. It was a, a 22nd, a 21st century town, um, thir you know, in the year 20, what did I say, 2013? 2013. 20, 20, uh, yeah, 43, 2013. <clears throat> and, um, it was just uh, demolished. It was a demolished town. There was very little standing and uh, maybe a few rooms of, you know, a few broken houses. That was all it was. Many people conglomerated in a kind of unstructured way um, and they murdered each other on a regular basis. It was, um, there was no society of order. It was, it was disordered. It was, it was chaos that came and went. And that reminds you of the 18th, 19th century. Um, there, was, um, there was, you know, symbols of that. Anyway, so and as you as you reported, you know, at the end he reaches Alcatraz, which is an odd place to, to be Mecca, but there's a guy in there and he's played his, his name is Michael Gambon. He plays yeah. George and he runs Alcatraz. Yeah, and, and he collects books and, and he's been looking for a long time for the Saint James Bible. Yeah. Um okay, so and he and he finds it and and um Denzel Washington has been wounded. Up to that point he could not be wounded. And he, only, he was only wounded uh, when he had given the Bible up, you know, to, to this badass guy. Yep. Okay. And so he's dying and he's, re he's, he's repeating it, the Bible, from cover to cover out of the recollection of 30 years of reading the Braille. Yep. Okay. All right. So stop there. Now, what does this all mean? Aside from great acting by Denzel, and he was, you know, given awards for this movie, and so are some of the others. Um, and, the, and the screenwriters and the directors, they really did very well. To me, it was um, a value, you know, production value is very, very high. And after a while, you got into this dystopian world and try to figure out, you know, who this man was and how he was operating and, and what motivated him and gave him this fantastic strength. You know, they would surround him by the dozens and he would kill them all instantly with his big knife he had. Um, he was uh, as strong as any Zatoichi ever was. And you find out over time that he's blind. It's really a knockout. But the thing, the thing here, and I relate it to current affairs, okay, is that without the Bible, okay, without a book, and um, uh, what's his name? Carnegie knew this. You have chaos, and you rule by force. You take what you want. Exactly. And the Bible can be a... A, um, a, 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 a liberal ordering mechanism that allows people to live in relative security. If everybody, you know, before the Bible, it was kind of a madhouse. The Bible arguably helped to civilize things. Yep. Uh, arguably, it helped to civilize Europe and from Europe elsewhere. The Bible has had more influence on human conduct in this world than any other book. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that I, I find that much value in it personally, but and I guess you don't, but, but people did. And it, it set up systems and rules and morality uh, that have lasted for 2,000 years. Okay? So, <clears throat> so without the Bible in the 30-year period following the Holocaust and in this dystopian, horrible world of yeah. violence and take what you want, um, they were missing uh, an order, a system, um, some kind of 
you know, social compact. They were missing it. There were no rules. Now, the, the Bible had given, um, at least in, in the first millennia after Christ, the Bible gave rules. Um, in the second millennia, I'm not so sure. Because uh, in one review I saw, a guy said, well, the Bible can be used either way, can it? And indeed, um, <clears throat> Carnegie wanted to use it to achieve his own uh, agenda, which was unkind. Precisely. Uh, and so, you know, you get that message. The Bible can be used to create a, a liberal, uh, tolerant order, a kindness, a decency, um, but it can also be used the other way. And um, the Denzel character, what's, Eli, what, oh, Eli yeah. he, <clears throat> he, knew, he knew that it was a good thing or it could be used for good. And his mission was to deliver it to somebody who agreed with him. Uh, and that would be George, uh, make that, yeah, George played by Michael Gambon. No, no, George was, was one of the cannibals. No, no, George, George was uh, the guy who ran uh, Alcatraz. Alcatraz, oh, really? Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, and of course, uh, Carnegie wanted the Bible for his own purposes. Right. So <clears throat> what you get out of this uh, is, is a modern day comparison, a modern day Study. I mean, this was this movie was made, you know, what uh, twelve years ago. Twelve years ago. <clears throat> uh, of what happens when you have no social order? Uh, without the Bible, there was no social order. Yep. They both knew that they could create an order, at least for a while, out of the Bible. And so, what we have here today is a world without social order. And I guess if I were looking for a takeaway message from all of this is uh, although the Bible can cut two ways, the Bible is one way to deliver a system, okay, of social order. And we need that. Uh, we need the United Nations. We need to have collaborative instruments where we can all follow a set of moral principles. And unfortunately, the Bible has been misused, uh, at least in the latter part of the, uh, well, maybe, maybe the whole second millennia. It has been corrupted and distorted used for bad purpose. But theoretically, a Bible or something like a Bible could be used for good. Um, and I think that's really central in this, in this movie. I don't disagree with you on anything about Carnegie. You know, he was going to use this for his own bad ends, you know, and that, that the Bible has been, um, you know, a, a force for maintaining order and, and decency and civility, you know. That's not my my issue, you know. Um, uh, yes, I agree with you completely. You know, I mean, you know, that's definitely true. I mean, that's not a disagreement at all. I mean, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, um, about what the Bible has done, what it, you know, the socially what it has done to for civility, you know, uh, up until at least maybe in the first. Movie. I think the more interesting study <clears throat> is the transition, if you will. You know, you could say that uh, when the Romans were, you know, invading everything in Europe, you know, let's do, let's take Gauls today. We're going to, we're going to, you know, an, uh, we're going to invade Gaul and own Gaul today, right now, which was France in those days. Um, you know, so that, that really is not a great way for people to live together. It's, uh, it's intolerable and it's unsustainable. You have to have a social order that says, no, you don't. You don't invade the next, you know, village or country and take and rape and pillage. You don't do that. Somebody has to say no. And I think for a while, at least in the first millennia, um, with, you know, Christianity, there was at least some source of strength and knowledge and, and, and acceptable rhetoric um, that said no. But somewhere along the line, the church the Catholic Church particularly, became corrupted yeah. and, and acted instead to, A, um, you know, uh, uh, in, enhance its own power over people uh, to get rich and to allow corruption all up and down the chain uh, to help it in doing those things. And, of course, the, the same principles exist with other large religious organizations. You know, hence, uh, in, you know, in our Constitution, there's a provision, the First Amendment, this separates church and state. They understood this. Yes. You've got to, you know, if religion were perfect, uh, you wouldn't need to have government, would you? 
But religion by then was clearly imperfect, uh, and you needed to have government by and for the people and so forth. Um, so I think that the study really here is where the church began to lose that original ability and role at maintaining a moral social order. Somewhere it happened. I can't tell you where, George. I know the Albigensian crusade where there was a, in, in, in France, you know, uh, they had a different view of Christianity and they were completely they went in and massacred the Catholic Church. Went in and massacred everybody. You know, so um, it was in. I mean, I've read the Alba, the Albigensian beliefs and real purity. You know, and, and the church was corrupted at that point. So it, it definitely turned. I think that was in the eleven hundred, twelve hundred. Yeah, I, that's why I kind of loosely divided it between the the first millennia and the second millennia. In the first millennia, somehow it, it hadn't gone so far off the edge. In the second millennia, say by the 12th, 13th, 14th century, it had really gone off the edge. And, and it, it continued. It continued. It was corruptible and corrupted. Um, and, you know, I don't think we've spent, at least in my education, enough time in figuring that out and figuring out how much credibility actually do you give the church and, and how much credibility do you give a government like our government that seems to be inviting control by the church, as you may have seen in the Roe v. Wade issue, yes. uh, and, and many others. Yeah, I, I totally agree that there's got to be separation of ch church and st state. You know, um, Anson Chong, Ch Ch Chong I, I was in touch with him before he passed away. He was the head of the uh, separation of church and state here in Hawaii. He was running it. So I totally agree to separation of church and state. And, you know, from my reading, you know, it's not that I have a problem with what the Bible is saying. It's that there were so many books that were left out by the early church fathers, different views from, from the disciples, from Jesus's inner circle that, that were just completely, you know, done away with. And his family, you know, his, his corporal family, nobody talks about that. So that was my problem, not the, the bigger picture that you're talking about of maintaining civility. So that was where my disagreement. Happens. Well, I know you in part. Um, I don't disagree with your disagreement. I'll tell you what I mean. Yeah. Um, this the, the the whole thing is a mission to protect and advance this Bible, the St. James Bible. Uh, I understand that, and uh, it was it was a religious connotation to it, of course. And some people on the religious side of the of the equation must have loved it. Um, but the other thing is that, and I'm reading from one of the reviews on um, on the on the on the web. Um, this is, describes the whole movie, a post-apocalyptic tale in which a lone man fights his way across America in order to protect a sacred book that holds the secret to saving humankind. And <clears throat> the problem with that is, uh, as we have discussed, it, yeah, it could save humankind. It could also destroy humankind. Uh, and it, it was very, uh, it is now, in my view, uh, very negative in, in terms of saving the world. But for a while, it was very critical, uh, you know, I mean, very critically helpful in, in, in preserving order. So I, I think it's too simplistic to say that they were all interested in this book because it could save humankind. It could, but it wouldn't necessarily. And we have to figure out a better system. Yeah, you have to understand, Jay, that the directors, the Hughes brothers, it's like another Obama. They were raised by their Armenian mother uh, after the dad, their black dad left, right? The little twins, the Hughes. And, you know, I know the Armenian church is very, very, you know, got very specific views of Christianity and Jesus. And they were raised, the Hughes brothers, even though they're black, they were probably raised in the Armenian church. So they've got this very, you know, standard view of Christianity that I have pretty much, you know, broadened my thinking of, you know, and I see Christianity from a bigger perspective. So, so you know, you got to understand who these directors were. They probably really devout Christians, you know. Um, so, you know who the, who the, I always look whenever I see an article, who the players are, who's writing the article, what is their interests, what is their background? I always look up the author's background on Wikipedia to see where they're coming from, because you have to understand the person's um, 
view, worldview, gestalt, they call it, right? Worldview to understand where they're coming from. And these directors are very, you know, these two Buz brothers, they're probably very devout Christians. Armenian Christianity is, you know, a certain way, certain approach that a lot, some of my cousins belong to. So you gotta, I mean, that's the issue is like, yes, this Bible has been good to, for civ civility, but, you know, they, they cut out a lot of other views, you know, and we've talked about Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, I've read all the Dead Sea Scrolls, I know the bigger picture. So leave, let's leave it at that. We don't have a disagreement about what this movie was all about. We don't have a disagreement that the Bible in the first millennia, and even now is maintains civility for some, but then as this Roe versus versus Wade thing, you know, um, separation of church and state, I totally believe in this. Well, I, you know, if you look at Roe v. Wade, uh, you see the imprint of the church there. Yeah. You see yeah. the church actively campaigning against abortion. That's part of its, um, you know, that's part of its doctrine. And uh, it is in the politics up to its eyeballs. It shouldn't be doing that. You know, the, the conceptual deal around the First Amendment was, um, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make you exempt. We're gonna give you special rights, tax benefits and this and that. Um, but you have to promise us that you're not gonna get involved in government. That's the nature of the deal in the First Amendment about church and state. But, and they made that deal, but the church has not kept out of politics. And right now it is, it is, in, it is in, in, in politics way up to its eyeballs. This is a very big problem in this country, and you can see what's, what's happening, very divisive. You know, I heard a, a program, I'll, I'll just tell you this very briefly, on National Public Radio yesterday, where they had an Orthodox woman rabbi uh, from New York, actually she was in South Africa, and she was saying, you know, under the Orthodox view um, of uh, abortion, um, it, it's permitted in the Orthodox Jewish, you know, doctrine is permitted. Um, and sometimes, depending on the circumstances, it's required. It's required under the doctrine. So wait a minute. Uh, my religion sometimes requires abortion, and you're telling me that the government, because of the influence of other religions, which have control of the government, in violation of the First Amendment, uh, can tell me that my religion should take a flying leap. And it's their religion that counts, um, that a woman who uh, is required by the doctrines of her religion to have an abortion cannot have abortion because another religion has, um, you know, hij hijacked the Constitution and imposed its own doctrine. That's really not what it's about. But uh, it was a very interesting discussion, and I, and I wonder if it will ever get anywhere. And you know, I have a very personal sensitivity to this because my dad's only sibling, 31. She was married, 19, in, she was born in 1910. In 1931, in the pits of the depression, a married woman, she decided she had, she got pregnant. She decided they couldn't afford a kid. So she went and she had an illegal abortion and she died at 21. So, and my dad's only sibling, right? So I never had an aunt on that side and my grandmother was de devastated, right? So bottom line is, you know, there's women who are going to die because of this if Roe v. Wade is 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 gotten rid of. So, um, separation of church and state. Is well, now that's very interesting that you raised that, and it reminds me of a central point in the movie we are reviewing. Now, you remember the nuclear holocaust of uh, what 2013, right? Yes. In the timeline in the movie. Yeah, <clears throat> there are a number of remarks made um, by some of the uh, older older people who had been alive mm -hmm. at the time in the 19, uh, 2013, <clears throat> who said um, that the Holocaust was caused by religious arguments. That religion <clears throat> was a central point in the divisiveness that destroyed the world. I don't know if you caught that, but it was mentioned a couple of times, and I'm saying, my God, these guys, no, I shouldn't say my God here in this context, my God, these, these guys really understood a few things uh, when they talk about religion and divisiveness and nuclear holocaust and the Bible. I mean, it's all, it's all what do you want to say, very provocative, yeah. and therefore worth watching the movie. 
Yes. Now, I'm the one who suggested it to you, but what rating do you give it, all these things considered? Pretty high. Uh, almost a 10. But I, I mean, now that you explained to me the Braille thing, you know, which really bothered me, I'd say I would give it a 10, you know, with a, with a better understanding of, of all the factors that I missed, you know, because I, I have my own blinders on, you know, um, from my own, you know, experiences. So, yeah, I'd give it a 10. You know, it, it, there's a lot of subtle, subtle things being presented here that I didn't catch that you caught. Yeah, I remember the woman, uh, the, the, I guess it was the mother and uh, the one who uh, Gary Oldman kept around him. Is uh, played by Jennifer Beals. Yeah, uh, she was blind. Yeah, so bl yeah. blindness is a is a is is a direct um, issue in this in this movie. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you why I give it a ten. Yeah. Okay, and it really has nothing to do with what we've been talking about. Although that's very instructive, of course. Yeah. Um, it's the fight over the cat in the bar, where mm, he swats a cat. He Denzel swats a cat onto the floor because it's walking on the bar, and the owner of the cat. Uh, who he knows to be a violent murderer, comes over and picks a fight with him. And it's that bar scene with that fight uh, where you first see Denzel doing his thing uh, like Zatoichi. <laughs> it is the most incredible fight you have ever seen. I mean, and they mention the reviewers mention this is one of the high points in the movie, um, the way they handle this. I mean, so on production values, uh, on the acting, on the powerful present powerful performance of Denzel Washington and Gary Oldman and some of the others. This has got to be a 10. Very good perform performance. Actors, yeah. very good acting. Yeah. Gary, Denzel Washington, Jennifer Beals, even uh, Mila Kunis, all very good acting. Yeah. I, I, I think it primo, primo acting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, George. Thank you for this discussion. Thank you. Talk to you about the next one soon. Yep. Uh, take care. Be safe. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Bye -bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.